wanted to entertain the troops. What do I do request? You mean like go? Or, or, uh, no. Do you? Would you if I asked nicely? Does that matter? You're going to see something quite unusual in a couple of minutes. So what, what can I do? What, I don't know why I'm here. Well, well, you're going to talk to us, but what are you going to play for us? Well, That's the question. Well, where am I going to be sitting in the end? You, you're okay. going to be here. Well, if I can just... Hey, good afternoon. I, I can't see very many people. Um, why well, I brought this. Um, I, I did a, uh, an abattoir uh, convention in Aberystwyth. Um, and it was an hour long, and I thought I had to entertain the troops somehow, and so... I thought I ought to include this because <clears throat> at one time I was a singist or a singer and I had a recording contract with Decca and I, and I got this contract with Decca because I wrote a song about the Beatles um, and it was an anti-Beatles song and I, I hated the Beatles because at Stratford-on-Avon, I was with the Royal Shakespeare Company, the whole theatre was full of Beatles sounds, uh, yeah, 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 day and night because of two people. One was an actor called John Normington, and the other was a now very, very famous lady called Dame Penelope Keith. Non-stop Beatles, and I hated them. They were, uh, <coughs> with a vengeance. So I wrote a song called What on Earth are Beatles? I, I won't sing that. And I was signed up by Decker, because Decker, as you probably know, had turned them down. And I was signed up by Dick Rowe, who is famous or infamous for turning the Beatles down. Now, the fact that he signed up Bowie and the Stones and... Tom Jones and lots of other people seems to be passed by, but he turned down the Beatles. And to sort of get back at them, they're going to have me sing this song, What on Earth the Beatles. Um, and then just before they were going to release it, the Beatles started suing people. And so this was never released, even though I'd recorded it. And they put out a pop song instead called Down by the River and another song called Come on Home. And if you look either of them up on the internet, you can download them for absolutely nothing. Uh, I get nothing, so this is no, I don't have any uh, interest in this whatsoever. Um, but at the same time that I was recording these things, in my music publishers, they played me a little disc. And in those days, there used to be, I don't know, I'm sure you're a very young audience, they used to have little cubicles where you can go in and record a song. A song you'd written, a song you sort of sang, and that little disc could lead to fame and fortune because you sent it to a music publisher, they listened to it, they said, you're the next Adam Faith, you're the next Cliff Richard, whatever. They signed you up, they changed your name, you made a record, and you were a millionaire. <coughs> and he played, when I was in, my music publisher, a disc had been sent by two young men who, I'm afraid to say, did actually come from Essex. Um, <laughs> and they'd recorded this song with no musical accompaniment together in this little thing and it was the worst thing you ever heard in your life and that without any possible chance of them ever hitting the top and being on the hit parade or even making a record. So that's one part. The other part is that in those days, as you probably know, dancers changed every week and I could never keep up and I was always, whether it was one dance behind, I was probably three dancers behind. So this, this guitar has probably gone out of tune since I came in. So I thought I'd stop. When I was at Aberystwyth, I had to say, I made the audience sing another song I'd written called All I Want for Christmas is a Dinosaur. <laughs> so you're getting off lightly. With, with <laughs> I'm, I'm not asking you to sing it, and you'll understand why as we go through it. But I just, just thought to get everyone in the right sort of mood, I'd try and sing this song, okay? It's called Me and My Mates. Oh, me and my mates don't... Me and my mates don't go a dancing no more, no more, no more, no more. More they're not doing the dance they were doing the week before. For four, we gave up fags and we gave up beer. Cost us a packy buying twisting gear. Now we find we're a dance behind and a fucking twist went out last year. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, fuck. <laughs> me, me and my mates just... <sighs> I used to like a little bit of dilly and dally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Uh, with a little chick I could pick up at the palais. But now the birds all dance with one another. I get lumbered with my little brother. Somehow or other, my little brother, he's fucking worse than me. me, me. Oh, I am slowly going out of my mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I always seem to be two dances behind. I used to have a lovely dream in my head. I'd meet the bird I was going to wed. It's my hard luck that I'm stuck with my fucking little brother instead. <laughs> so me and my mates gotta find something else to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like knocking down coppers and giving them the old one too. You put your left boot in and your left boot out. Give him your knee and shake it all about. Knocking a copper on the floor gets you more birds than you had before. They got three ears and I got four, so I can't go dancing no fucking more. <laughs> oh, fuck. <laughs> um, that, that, no, okay, uh, now, seriously, seriously, <clears throat> right, go, questions, no, go. Well, it was, it was interesting that you started, one of the lines was that you feel like you're losing your mind, I think, is that what you said? It, it comes up, yep. And now you're here in Romford. Uh, yes, I've never been to Romford before. What a treat. <laughs> Not. Yep. But thank you. Thank you well, for no, coming. I'm, I'm very glad to be. And I was really lucky to have a panel of lovely ladies here this afternoon. You were. Yep. Definitely. Well, th as I said, thank you very much for coming. Can you um, hear me? Sorry. Yes. <laughs> yeah. um, we're really grateful you're here. And we're going to talk to you about... Sex. And... <laughs> let's Chinese start. food. Oh, we can do that if you, okay, well, okay, if you'd okay. like. But how about... Um, let's start with how you got into acting uh, as a start. Okay. Um, no uh, theatrical relationships at all in my family. No one, parents, grandparents, nothing at all. Uh, my mother's first job was uh, playing the piano in the cinema in the days when talkies first came out. And so if the talkies broke down, she was one of those people who had to provide the sort of continuity for it. Uh, as far as I know, she never actually played in the cinema. Uh, but she, she, she played in pubs and things, so she was, she was quite sort of musical. But her main thing was, and which I, I didn't sort of follow her in this line, was she was quite a political animal. She was secretary of the Scottish, uh, the Paddington Labour Party. Uh, she was a founder member of the Catering and General Workers Trade Union, and her biggest claim to fame was that on the night of the late Queen's wedding, um, the reception was held at the Savoy Hotel, and my mother was arrested for lying down in front of the Queen's car on her way into the hotel. And that was all in aid of, uh, I think, an Italian waiter who'd been, she wasn't working at the Savoy Hotel. It was in aid of a, a, an Italian waiter who'd been sacked. So she was famous for one day, and then after that, it was all me. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, let's talk about how you made that move through acting did you you know what was your first acting role and uh, lead us out through that okay well uh, i left school i had to do my national service which i did in germany i uh, had the time of my life um, and then after that i was very lucky to go to oxford university on a sort of scholarship uh, i did after my first year i did a few sort of plays with the Oxford Theatre Group and the, the, at the Playhouse Theatre. Um, and uh, I was at the Edinburgh Fringe for two successive years uh, with people who went on to fame and fortune like Ken Loach. Um, and then in my beginning of my third year, I was asked to audition for the Royal Court Theatre. And I went and auditioned there and they said, well, we quite like you, but um, so grow, you have to grow up a little bit and get a bit more practice and then we might see you again. So I went back to Oxford to get on with my studies. Um, 
And then about two weeks later, there was a phone call from the Royal Shakespeare Company saying uh, that it had been, I'd been recommended by the Royal Court as a possible young lead at Stratford, the Royal Shakespeare Company. So I was invited to audition uh, in a theatre in London, and I went there, where they were doing Twelfth Night. Um, Vanessa Redgrave was the leading lady in it, and she came on stage, and we read a little bit of it, um, and then she kissed me, uh, and uh, off I went back to Oxford, and I had the marks of a lipstick on my cheek, which I'd left there so I could point out to people, uh, and then nothing happened again. And then two weeks later, I got a, through one of the people at Oxford, I got a, another message saying that the Royal Shakespeare want, Company wanted to sign me up as a long-term artiste, uh, that they would guarantee me four years' work and pay me every week for four years, and that I would take over one of the leading parts at Stratford. And I still had two terms to do at Oxford. So I... Well, I can't say I worked my way through. Um, I did my sort of two years. I sat my last exam on a Wednesday morning. I got on my motorbike. I drove to Stratford, and I was rehearsing that same afternoon with Vanessa Redgrave on stage at Stratford. Wow. Really so, like I said, the, uh, luck, just absolute <coughs> luck. And um, do you want to talk to us about some of those early roles? Uh, well, I wasn't very good. I, mean, that, I, I remember... <laughs> um, my agent came to the first night, and uh, afterwards they came around and said uh, it was very good, uh, what we could hear of it, which uh, another, one of the others said, you looked great, which means your acting wasn't very, very, very good. And then what I especially remember was the curtain call, because I was in the middle between um, Vanessa and an actor called Eric Porter, holding their hands. I mean, right in the middle, the whole, the whole cast. And when it came to the final curtain call, uh, Vanessa pulled me forward, which I thought was a really sweet of her, and Eric pulled me back. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I didn't get my solo thing. But I say I did, I did three years there. I, uh, I, I didn't honestly do I started at the top and I worked my way very, very quickly to the bottom. Um, and I couldn't understand what it was. I mean, I knew I wasn't doing the things that I was capable of. I mean, I've always had a, a big, big voice, which I could use, and I, I just sort of couldn't use it there. And my, we used to have a, an end-of-term sort of notice. You really went and saw the headmaster type, Peter Hall, and, and he said that I was too diffident. Um, now, do you all know what diffident means? No. Well, well, I mean, I thought it meant difficult, and I was Ooh. really... I, I got stroppy because I wasn't difficult. I loved being at Stratford. It was like being at university again, except I was being paid and surrounded by the most beautiful people in the world. And I thought, I'm not difficult. So it, it, it upset me. Whereas, I mean, diffident means being, being backward at coming forward, too shy. And I was obviously not investing enough of myself in the parts I was playing. So I left Strat Stratford rather under a cloud, did some tellies and things. And then I did David Hare's first play. Dave, so David Hare, are you all familiar with David? One of the greatest English playwrights of the sort of present sort of generation and one generation past. And I was in his first play, um, and we were at a theatre in Brighton, and it was absolutely jam-packed, and the audience were right there on the end of that table. I could see that a nose there, and I was acting here. And, and suddenly, everything lifted, and I just thought, I mean, I can't get away with being mm. diffident here. I've, I've got to express myself, show my voice, show my personality, show everything that I have got as an actor. It's got to come out tonight. Yeah. And it came out that night. I don't know how. It, it was just a turning point in my life. Mm. And the bizarre thing is, if um, David wrote a, um, a little memoir that came out a couple of years ago, I've, and I've only just read it, but... He says he could never make up his mind whether he thought he was good enough as a writer to be a writer as a profession. I think he was offered a, a director's thing at the, with the BBC. But he didn't think he was good enough until one night, a Saturday night in Brighton, everything changed. And what he heard on stage made him realise that what he was writing was good and deserved to be seen by lots of people and appreciated. And it was the same night that I lifted things off the page, and I say it changed my acting career completely, mm -hmm. that I was, I was totally unafraid to expose myself in every sort of possible way, in any sort of possible part, mm -hmm. uh, and that's remained the same until I sort of stopped doing it. But that one single night in Brighton. 
I saw uh, an interview with you on YouTube and it said that you were the most proud of your theatrical work. Mm -hmm. um, well, I, when, how did the transition happen from you being a theatre actor to a television actor initially? Uh, is it well, something you, what, what I should elaborate on is, is it something that you sought out or is it something that sort of came to you? No. When, when I became an actor, I thought I am going to be doing. I mean, remember this is way back in '62. '62, I, '62, yeah, uh, I joined the Royal Shakespeare Company. In in, in those days, in TV films had nothing to do with it. I thought I was going to be a professional actor, that I would be doing classical roles for the rest of my life. I might do an occasional pantomime, but but that was it. Television films never came into it at all. And then while I was at Stratford, I was offered the lead in Kidnapped by the B BBC Scotland. They were doing a serial, which I couldn't do because I was under contract to Stratford. And uh, another actor with almost the same name, Ian Cullen, played that part. Uh, and then I, I left the, the, the Royal Shakespeare Company and the parts were offered to me. I did uh, a thing um, about um, the customs officers um, which is no one can find a recording of. Um, and then I was asked to do another Scottish serial called Flight of the Heron, um, which B uh, STV were doing in Scotland. And when the girls were talking about sort of money this, this afternoon, STV, this is way back in 64, five, they did um, six episodes uh, of this story, The Flight of the Heron. Um, it was shown uh, in the afternoon and in the evening, and they made those six episodes all on location in Scotland with a large cast and a massive amount of activity going on for £60,000. I mean, and today, that's just silly money. I mean, mm. one actor would probably get that for a week's work. Yeah. But that, that was the start of me sort of moving into telly in any sort of big way. So... I mean, I've got to go there. <sighs> the 1970s, you, so we spoke earlier on, you said about you were in Colditz, yeah. and then of course the 1970s, and Survivors. Yeah. Um, how did you end up in that role? Um, you, you cropped up in episode two, I believe, didn't you? Yeah, I wasn't in the first, the best episode, I wasn't in the first episode. <laughs> no, really, it was a stunning episode, and I, I, my character wasn't in it. Um, but it's, it's, and it's also rather like that clip you saw from uh, Zombie, because uh, I was meant to be an American in Survivors as well, and I was meant to be an American in that. Right. And I said, I can't do the accent, so they made me a limey, which is why Fulci has that line there, about just because your uncle bought the paper, you think you can write your own British prose. <laughs> But yeah, so how, how did you end up in the Survivors? Um, well, I said I did, uh, did I describe the thing about getting into Colditz? The, yes, yeah. you did. Well, yeah. I mean, in Colditz was directed, directed by Terry Dudley, and Terry Dudley <coughs> was the producer of Survivors. And because of that, he thought that I was right for the character that Greg, the character I played in um, in Survivors was supposed to be, rather grumpy, rather self-centered, and who didn't want to be attached, if possible, to anyone else in the world. Mm. Uh, didn't really like people, and I, and I think his first line is, when he comes back, um, flies in on a helicopter and finds his wife dead on the floor and says, and I, says something like, you know, silly bitch, this is the sort of thing I'd expect you to do. <laughs> um, he, was, he was that sort of character, which is obviously a joy to play. But, you know, the series was really groundbreaking, wasn't it? Because you could end up sort of three or four episodes on where this sort of mock trial occurs. And there was a little bit of, I wouldn't say outrage, but there was a lot of talk at the time, wasn't there, about um, the execution of one of the characters... Do you, how, what was your view on, on that and how it all kind of played out? Would you, would you think that was like a really good thing for the series? Well, it was one, it was one of the best written episodes. Uh, what was it called? <sighs> Law and Order, yeah. Um, it was just, when you, when you get a good script, I mean, then you've got a good TV programme, usually. And that was a really good script. I didn't even know whether Terry Nation wrote it, was it one of his? Um, 
but it was just one of those things that was sort of easy to do, and you know, people were taking sides all the way through it, so you knew that the audience would be taking sides when they were watching it. Um, and it got a little bit silly because I think, have, have we, all of you seen this? Any of you seen this? Because <clears throat> it turned out she was killed with an arrow. Now, I mean, people don't get stabbed to death with an arrow. And you might, you know, like Harold might get one through the eye at the Battle of Hastings, but you don't have an arrow and stab people. And I think that was what was supposed to be the, the sort of weapon that sort of did it. Um, but beside, apart from that, I mean, it was, it was a lovely sort of argumentative thing. And when the, there are opposing sides taken by a cast in quite a strong way and with a dialogue, mm. and that, it makes good tell. Like Succession, the reason why Succession is so good is because of the, sort of the fighting between, the infighting between the, all the sort of casts and family. Yeah. And it was the same with that. And we had two opposing sides made the decision, whatever it was. And as you say, there's an execution, which my character had to do, mm. go out with a rifle and then shoot this poor soul, in, innocent soul, yeah. and then find out that, in fact, he hadn't done it, yeah. and, and then live with the consequences or the thoughts about it. Um, but it was, ju it was just, I mean, a stunning episode, and you know, sadly, there weren't enough of them. Mm. As the series progressed, you got a little bit more control into the series, didn't it? How did that come about? My personal control, or yeah, you know, like you 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 stepped outside the <coughs> the actor role, didn't you? And I, I think you you did. Am I right? You wrote a couple of episodes, I wrote three, and you, yeah. yeah and did, you were a pro producer. Yeah. Well, uh, you're all familiar with Survivors, because okay? I, I mean, I I didn't get any money from the BBC for about three years, and then suddenly I got a cheque for about four thousand pounds. And it was after COVID, and it was all people who had come to seeing Survivors, uh, you know, 50 years on, because next year is the 50th anniversary of actually doing it. We did these in 75, the first ones. And I got a big, big check because so many people had been buying it. So that we knew that there's a new generation, rather like zombie or whatever, uh, who were sort of watching it. Um, but what's, what was apparent to me then, and may have been apparent to you as viewers, was that the second series was poorer than the first. And the problem was that the producer, Terry Dudley, wanted to go a different line, take a different line than Terry Nation. Mm. So they had a sort of gentlemanly disagreement. And when I asked Terry Nation why he wasn't writing any more scripts, he, he just said very diplomatically, um, um, I think almost as exact words, I, I don't think I've got anything more that I can contribute, which wasn't the case, because he, he wanted to write the scripts and wanted to be in control of it. And Terry Dudley, as the producer who had the final word, said, that's not the way I want to go. So Terry Nation withdrew. And as a result of that, and even though Terry Dudley used to say to me, I have writers queuing up to write for this, because we said we had aud regular audiences of between eight and nine million a week watching this. He said he had queues of actors, uh, writers wanting to contribute. Mm. Um, none of them turned up. And the scripts, I thought, in the second series were poor. I said, um, I reckon I could write better. So he said, well, you write one. If we like it, we'll commission it and pay you. Um, if not, put it on the, you know, in a bin. Um, so I wrote one. I called a friend in need. Uh, they agreed to do it. And I got 600 pounds, and I put it as a deposit on the first house I ever bought, um, which you could do with 600 pounds in those days. Um, and that, for, that was the right beginning of the writing. And the series went downhill, I thought, and the figures, the viewing figures went downhill. And so I said, uh, I won't be doing series three. Mm. So supposedly I, I left at the end of series two, and then I got a phone call from Terry Nation saying, we need you to come back just for one episode <clears throat> for continuity purposes. And you can write it, you can direct it, you can be the only actor in it, you can do the editing. You will have total control over this and anything that happens in it as long as you're dead at the end of it. And so I, I wrote my death episode, which is called um, The Last Laugh, uh, which of all my writing, acting, or whatever is the thing I'm really proudest of. Um, and I did another episode called A Little Learning, and then that was me out of it. And then the series sort of fizzled out. I'm sure in a little while when we go to audience questions, we're going to cover this next topic quite a lot. Um, but just how on earth did you end up getting into Italian cinema to have, have sort of three consecutive films? 
Uh, I, was, I was in rep in Exeter uh, doing a play. I was on my own. I, I was in terrible digs, which were damp and dingy. I was not getting any money. The audiences weren't very good. Reviews were reasonable. No friends were going to come down. Um, no one could afford to come down. And then suddenly, out of the blue, there was a phone call from my agent saying, <coughs> there's an Italian film company called Variety Films, and uh, they want you to be in one of their movies. And uh, it's a leading role, and there are locations in New York, uh, the Caribbean, and Rome. Uh, they're offering you a uh, thousand pounds a week for the film. There's a seven week um, timetable. So that's seven thousand pounds, and they'll pay you a thousand dollars a week living allowance. Mm -hmm. And they've agreed that they will fly your girlfriend, partner, whatever, first class <coughs> to whichever of the three locations you would like to take them to, uh, but they'd like an answer tomorrow. Now, it was a very difficult decision to make. <laughs> um, no, no, I mean, I, I, I just sort of jumped at it. And, and then they said, oh, it's, it's got zombies in it. And zombies to me was, I thought it was a Bob Hope film. It may, may have been um, another couple of American comics, but I've been Lou Costello, I think, did mm. a zombie thing. Yes. So I, th I thought it was that sort of, sort of zombies set in sort of Jamaica or whatever. Uh, and then it turned out to be the zombie flesh eaters that you, know, you see bits off behind me. And then you go from one straight into another. They, uh, it's your problem, in, in those Italian films, they, they pre-sell them. So they more or less covered their costs before they went on. So ev everything else was a profit. And they, they knew or thought at that time that they were going to do reasonably well. This, of course, was before the video nasty stuff came in. Um, and so I think within a month of doing finishing that, I was offered uh, the next one, Cannibal, Zombie Holocaust? Yes. Zombie Holocaust. Uh, sorry, it's got about so many titles, I forget them. I could have said Dr. Dr. Butcher. Butcher. And yeah. then before I even finished that one, I was offered contamination. Right. Uh, and then they saw through me. Uh, I'm, and, I, and I have to say their main worry was the fact that I was bald. Um, when, I, when, I, when I arrived uh, on set in New York to, for that very first, for, for doing um, zombie uh, flesh eaters, two producers were there, Ugo Tucci and, and uh, Fabrizio De Angelis. And they were quite small men. And then they were, they were suddenly standing on tiptoe, looking at the top of my head, the back of my head. And, it, and it, you, you see what it's like now. I mean, it, it was like that then. I mean, they were terrified, mortified that they could have a leading man in this film who was bald. Um, and I mean, they, got rid, they were gesticulating and panicking almost what to do. And what they decided to try and do in it was to shoot as much from below as possible so that you didn't see the top of my head. Although occasionally, even in that, that scene you just saw, the back of my head appears and occasionally. Um, so that, that was my launch straight into it. Um, and I, I got a wig for the second film. And if you look at that carefully, you'll see that it nearly falls off several times. It flips over. I mean, it's, no one else notices it. I notice it every time it's, it comes, sort of comes up. And then I managed to lose it in, in New York before we came back. So that caused trouble. And then I had, a, for the contamination one, I had a really nice week that stayed on all the way through. <laughs> okay. when, you, when, you, when you were shooting them, you know, what were your thoughts on what you were making at that moment in time? Money. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I, honestly, they were fun to do. When, when you do these films, they, they treat you like a prince. And the, the, I've often said it, the difference between um, you know, making something in Britain and making something there is, was really the, the crew, because there, they, I mean, they worked like slaves. I mean, all hours of the day, they didn't have break. Well, they had a break where they had one of those peculiar little Italian coffees, which disappeared in two seconds. They didn't have breaks. They just went on and on and on. Mm. And if they had to change a scene or change the lighting, it, it was done in a couple of minutes. It would take half an hour or an hour because yeah. of union rules and all the rest in Britain. So they moved through. Well, they had to for money reasons. But they moved through all these things so quickly. And the fact is they didn't just do it quickly. They did it brilliantly because they put heart and soul into it and all the craft and professionalism that they sort of had. So all these films, I mean, however stupid and silly, they look absolutely stunning. And probably the, only, the special effects are stunning. The only things I, I don't think stunning are the sort of personal makeups because they want to make you up to look like an Italian film star. Yeah. And if you're a Glaswegian, you, it's not quite what you expect to do. 
So in England, I'd do a TV program, and they, if I was lucky, I'd spend 10 minutes in the makeup chair. And in, in Italy, I spent between half an hour and an hour every day in the makeup. I'm but being over made up. Of theatre, television, or cinema, what, in your opinion, is your proudest moment? There are several. I mean, that I've done. That, that I'm not proud in that way of anything I've done other than cold uh, on in TV. Uh, I'm proud of. Uh, you won't believe it from the singing you heard. Uh, uh, some of the music I've written. Um, one of which was hugely popular and successful in France during the student rebellion, way, way, way back in the late 60s. Uh, they're all classical parts. Uh, a, Macbeth, which is an easy part for me to play. Dr. Faustus, which is a very difficult part to play, which I love doing. Anthony and Anthony and Cleopatra, which I did with Kate O'Mara, who was an absolutely stunning stage actress, an underrated stage actress, sadly no longer with us. Uh, and Equus. Uh, I played the psychiatrist in Equus, and I love doing it, and it's a gift of a part to an actor. And, and I say it, it caused the, 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 the happiest and the unhappiest day of my acting career mm. because my agent said, um, I've had a phone call from Peter Hall, and uh, he wants to know if you would like to take over from Anthony Hopkins on Broadway playing the part of the psychiatrist. It's only for six weeks or whatever because... Uh, Hopkins was, uh, had a throat infection and was ill, uh, so you'll only be there, um, but we would like to do it. And then I said, what's the bad news? And she said, the bad news is that the BBC, you're under contract to the BBC and they won't release you. Now, that, I you go to conventions and I tell that story because it's absolutely true. And I just thought, to go to Broadway and a part like that would have been absolutely amazing. Mm. It was played by a sort of second-rate nobody called Richard Burton eventually. So <laughs> he, he had his eyes on that part, as any actor sort of would. But the, the other bizarre thing, and it's typical, I mean, you're probably too young to sort of know Peter Hall. The bizarre thing is about how Peter, Paul, Peter Hall went about it. Because I was at a convention in Birmingham, and I was sitting in a bar with Michael Jason and Cosmo, whatever he's called, James Cosmo. And suddenly, just as I've said to you, I heard Michael Jason said, well, do you know what was the happiest and the happiest day of my life? And I thought, I've heard that before. He said, well, my agent rang, rang me up and said, Peter Hall wants to know if you'd like to take over the part of the psychiatrist in Equus on Broadway. And went on with Anthony Hopkins as ill. You were there six weeks. It was exactly the same story. And then he finished the story by saying that his agent then said, uh, but you can't do it because you're under contract to the BBC and they won't release you. And a bit bizarre thing. But I think, he, I think he offered it to about 12 different people, which is what he used to do at Stratford. You'd suddenly you'd get there thinking you're playing a part, and you found that someone else is sort of playing it. Uh, having said that, he was the most, most brilliant man of the theatre I've ever met, and an absolute charmer. Amazing. Thank yep. you very much. Yeah, thank you. Have we got some questions from the audience? Don't be shy. Um, we've got one right over here. <coughs> I could probably hear you. Donde es el cuarto de baño? Um, what was it like working with Luigi Cosi as a contamination? Well, as those of you who are here this afternoon, I mean, he was the sweetest man possible. I mean, I mean an absolute sort of gent, quiet. I don't think I, I had any directions as to what to do. He just got on with it. It was his baby. He'd written it. Um, and I say he had a huge success with Star Crash that uh, Caroline had been in. And I've, I've, I mean, he actually couldn't have been nicer. And he was, when I did this awful song, uh, he, he was there at Abattoir with me and we had a lovely sort of Q&A. Uh, and I found out amazing things about the film which I sort of didn't know about. But what, what he didn't know, because I only found it in a, in a letter uh, I mean, a couple of years ago that I'd written from Barranquilla where we were on location. Uh, and this, this is just a, an example of how some Italian producers get on with their work. Um, I'd written home that um, in one scene in front of the entire crew, the whole cast, the producer, um, Mancini, had said to Luigi, the sweetest man in the world, if you are not more positive, I'm going to break your legs. Now... 
I mean, I don't know how many of your employers say that to you when you're doing your sort of jobs. You know, I've, I've been threatened with death by the three people making films. But for a producer to say, you know, I mean, but he said it with conviction. I mean, it, it wasn't, well, it was a sort of joke in a way. But he actually meant what he said, that if he didn't pull his finger out and get on with it and save him money, he was in trouble. Well, well believable. It was similar to what you said to me before I agreed to come here. <laughs> Have we got any other questions out there? Oh, the other two people who threatened to... Well, he didn't threaten to kill me. <clears throat> the three people, yeah. And the, the, the other silly thing, that two of them used almost exactly the same phrases. Um, the first one was in... Uh, what did I do first? Cromwell. Uh, I, I played a German officer. I've got one scene with Richard Burton, and, and I didn't know, but Clint Eastwood, I think, was in the same scene. Um, and we had the scene to do, and there was a stuntman who was in the scene as a German soldier. And if he wasn't in the scene, he was going to have to do, there were some really dangerous stunts in uh, Where Eagles There. Uh, am I, is that the first one? Yeah, Where Eagles yeah. There first yeah. was the first one. There's some really dangerous sort of stunts um, which risk life and limb for sort of stuntmen. And this lucky stuntman was doing, playing a part in the film proper, so he didn't have to go and do the stunt. So he thought he was getting off lightly. And we finished early. Um, and my girlfriend was then flying out, and I was going to meet her at the airport. So I said, am I clear? Yeah, you're finished for the day. You can go. So I went up to the summer, and I said, it's okay, clear. We can go. And he said, you effing C, I'm going to effing kill you. <laughs> now, I mean, you, I mean, I was an innocent, total innocent. Yeah. And I, mean, I really found it frightening because he was a strong guy, did amazing stunts. And I'd been told that in the past he'd had a disagreement with one, a fellow stuntman who was doing a flying act on an, on a, with a sort of one of those sort of rescue ropes, and he'd cut the rope to harm this, this sort of guy. Anyway, right. that, that was what the story was. It may not have been true. The, the second one was on Cromwell. Um, Richard Harris played the lead. Uh, Richard was a wonderful storyteller. But another brilliant storyteller was this sort of bodyguard. Uh, and, his, and his bodyguard, his name I can't remember, but he'd been the getaway driver for a criminal called Jack Spot. That ring any bells, a Soho gangster? Yeah, yeah. Anyway, he, he'd been his getaway driver, and this great big burly thug. And he very proudly would sort of open his shirt, and there was a scar right the way across his belly where someone had taken a knife and just ripped it up, ripped it through. And he was a terrifying thing. But he was a wonderful storyteller, like Richard, and he was going on telling his story, and we were all laughing. And everyone said, well, what about, what about? Um, and he'd come up with the story about that film. And then just joining in, and I had total innocence, I said, uh, uh, what happened on Hawaii? And there was a silence. And he, he said the same thing, you effing see, I'm going to effing kill you. <laughs> and I, I have, to this day, I've got no idea what, what happened on Hawaii. <laughs> And, it worried, and the, the other one, of course, I mean, I t I've told you before, is in, was in Zombie Flesh Eaters. But part of the thing when I signed my, the, 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 the deal that made me do it was I had a trailer, you know, a trailer for me and me alone. And th this is what big stars have. And big stars fight over how big they're, they want to be. I want to be bigger than Tom Cruise or Affleck or whatever. Mm -hmm. or, and I want to be further away from the loos. I want to be closer to the food closer to civilization, it's got to have this, that, and the other. But to have a trailer means you've mm. made it and arrived. Mm. Well, when we, when we got on location in a place called Latina, in, just outside Rome, Teaser, who, uh, someone told me this, sadly died in yes. January. Yeah. Was it you who told me? Yeah. Uh, uh, unbelievable. Uh, Teaser, Richard, uh, and myself had all been promised caravans. And there wasn't a caravan in sight, trailer in sight. And we all looked at one another. And I mean, I couldn't do anything because I was too sort of feeble and didn't have any sort of power over any of these situations. And then Richard said very, very simply uh, in Italian, no trailer, no trailer, difficult to work tomorrow. Mm. That's all he said. Yeah. And very gently, within an hour, there was a trailer there. <laughs> and within a second, Richard moved into it. And the teaser and I had no trailer, so we did the, whatever it was, three weeks location work there with no trailer. But I knew that when that finished, when he, he, his part finished, he was going to go back to the UK and I could take his trailer. Yep. So we finished his shooting, he left, and I thought, the trailer's mine, and they took the bloody thing away. <laughs> it just disappeared. And I said to the 
I mean, he, I said, where, 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 where is the trail? He said, he's gone. He said, well, it's mine. I mean, it says in my contract that I'm supposed to have a trail, and I would like a trailer. And well, you're not getting one. I s said, well, why am I not getting one? Because we don't want to give it to you. It's gone to Rome. And I said, right, well, I am going to Rome. How are you going to get there? I'm going to walk. It's 50 miles. I'm going to walk. <laughs> And that, that's when he, this is absolutely good, he, he, he went, me, Sicilian, you, you no leave Italy alive. <laughs> that, and he, I mean, the only reason an actor or whatever, like these other two guys, I mean, it was really said in a very vicious, convinced, I mean, it convinced me. Mm. But, I got a, and, and I, but I stuck my ground and, and, and I got through that. And again, almost immediately, the caravan appeared mysteriously. And the problem was, from my point of view, that there was no air conditioning in this bloody caravan. And the next three days were the hottest they had in Italy for years and years. Mm. And I, because I'd made such a fuss about it, I felt that I had to use this blessed trailer. <laughs> so I spent three miserable days sweating, almost dying, through being stroppy. But there anyway, three, three threats of death. Uh, and none so far from the audience this afternoon. No, they've, they've all been lovely, right. by but, and large. Are you, <coughs> are you keen on notices? Do, you, do any of you pay any attention to notices before you see a film? And is it notices about the actors or the, or the film themselves? Yeah. I mean, I, 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 I like, uh, you know, pe clever reviews. The, uh, Coxie, for example, the, the, the cheapest review I think you can give is to say, as they did about Luigi, uh, you know, Italy has produced some of the greatest uh, filmmakers the world has ever known, Antonio, Zeffirelli, da 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 da. Unfortunately, Luigi Cozzi is not one of them. Mm. Now, that, that's cheap. Mm. And, and my, my last thing I did at Oxford said, uh, there is one outstandingly good performance in this week's university production. Unfortunately, it is not that of Ian McCulloch in the leading part. Um, which sort of puts you down. But my favorite review for not this film, but the, the second one, Zombie Holocaust, was in a thing called uh, Eat Your Brains. It was on the web called Eat Your Brains. <laughs> yeah. And it said, and it says, uh, when they've run out of ideas uh, in the Italian schlock industry, Ian McCulloch listlessly wanders the earth, looking like a man in need of a beer and a shag. <laughs> <laughs> now, I, I think... That was brilliant. And he then added to it, he saves time and energy by giving exactly the same performance he gave in Zombie Flesh Eaters. So I, I wrote to the bloke who wrote it and said, this is absolutely brilliant. What, what I didn't like was, and I asked someone before when I was showing pictures on my table, and there's a, there was a picture where Karen had been in a film with Roger Moore. And I said to Karen, do you think I look like Roger Moore? And she said, well, perhaps. Well, I mean, I, I started off with Roger Moore lookalike. Um, I then got second-rate Roger Moore look-alike. <laughs> and then the last one I got was balding, middle-aged Roger Moore look-alike. So. Well, we have run out of time. So, can we have a big round of applause for Mr. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.